time management. If you spend all five days, you know, pen testing and that report is due Monday, guess what you're doing over the weekend? I may have spent some extra time finding a couple extra ways to get to DA, but totally dominate the network, you know, arguing with their C-suite because they wanted to downgrade every finding. I didn't even know what enumerate meant. And he was telling me to take the OSC fee and boy, did I get destroyed. The AI is not taking our jobs. We're in a safe field. Good note taking, you know, it, it took a while to kind of dig down in what note format had liked. Hi, I'm Kaiser Clark, and welcome to The Hacker's Cache, the show that decrypts the secrets of offensive security one bite at a time. Every week, I invite you into the world of ethical hacking by interviewing leading offensive security practitioners. If you are a penetration tester, bug bounty hunter, red teamer, or blue teamer who wants to better understand the modern hacker mindset, whether you are new or experienced, this show is for you. Hello, hello. Welcome to the Hacker's Cash. My name is Kaiser Clark. I've been in the cybersecurity field for over six years now, and I currently work as a full-time penetration tester. Today, I have Trent Darrow, who has done help desk and IT specialist for over four and a half years. He did some network engineering for over two years, did some time as a part-time networking instructor, and did cybersecurity contracting and consulting for over two years. And he has been a senior penetration tester for over a year now. Last but not least, while doing all that work that I just mentioned, he's been in the Army National Guard for the past 14 years and continues to serve as a cyber protection team crew lead warrant officer. For education, Trent has a bachelor's of science in information technology. For certifications, he has the OFSEC experience penetration tester, that's the OSEP, the OFSEC certified professional, that's the OSCP, GAC certified forensic analyst, that's the GCFA, the GAC web application penetration tester, that's the GWAPT, the GAC certified penetration tester, that's the GPEN or GPEN, and the GAC cloud penetration tester, that's that's the GCPN. Furthermore, he's got a couple of CompTIA certifications. So he's got the CompTIA Project Plus, A Plus, Network Plus, Security Plus, and Linux Plus. And he's also had a few certifications expire from Cisco, Splunk, and the Linux Professional Institute. So Trent, thank you so much for doing this episode with me. Go ahead and walk through your background and introduce yourself to the audience. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having me. Um... Yeah, originally it was going to college for athletic training. Did that for about two years. The whole time I worked in the uh, the student help desk there uh, for about three years. So when I'm on a first deployment, um, last year at college I did uh, computer networking. Uh, grew up, you know, messing with computers. Twin grew up messing uh, messing with computers, taking them apart, putting them back together. Um, the broken ones, you know, we'd skateboard with. But uh, you know, after that, I, after the deployment, I got a job uh, doing government contracting on our help desk. Uh, level one stuff eventually moved to the uh the va and uh did a lot of telecom um you know it intern stuff there got pretty good with their systems um got married me and the wife moved to uh texas uh she was doing her uh doctor residency um got a job on a base as a uh, network engineer as a contractor did that for about two years roughly um and went on our deployment and while I was overseas, I was able to uh, get the G pen um, and knock that out. So this landed me my first pen test job. Um, did that for about two years. Crazy schedule as uh, you know the starting pen test world is. Uh, eventually moved into you know DOJ contracting pen testing for just about a year, and now working uh, with Cenac, you know, trying to help build up their uh, the red team, trying to you know, give clients additional benefit. Nice. So are you spending most of your time like, like spinning up a red team uh, or are you also doing like some like traditional penetration tests while you're building up that red team as well? Yeah. So I can't say a lot because I got the job about a week or two before I <laughs> went out of orders uh, oh. to go to a warrant officer basic course. Um, but I do, I talked to the guys there. Uh, I know one of the, he's uh, doing a couple pen tests. Uh, I know that they're just trying to stand it out to get a uh, handful more people to uh, provide more, you know, red team type capabilities for their clients. So in your current role as a cyber protection team crew lead, can you tell me like what you're doing day to day for that role? Yeah. So just moved into that role about a year ago. Um, ranges anything from helping train the team. So uh, our team is traditional in the, uh, affected a cyber protection team. So we do a lot of digital digital forensics, system response, you know, protecting the uh, network type stuff. 
Um, so me and one other chief will go through, provide a uh, red, red effects. So the rest of the team, uh, has the opportunity to train and, um, you know, trying to find artifacts in the network, utilizing, you know, different sims. Um, otherwise, yeah, that's why I got the GCFA. I figured I needed a bit more experience than that. Um, uh, it's just, uh, right now a lot of training advisors to command around different training requirements, what its capabilities are, um, things like that. And then, uh, so you're, are you running a team like, uh, small team, big team? Yeah. So we're, we're pretty small. Uh, each team is pretty small. So I have, um, you know, maybe another chief underneath me, uh, we'll have a network analyst, a host analyst, and, uh, possibly attached an Intel person. Is it like, uh, cybersecurity analyst work or is it like cyber forensics? Yeah. Kind of, kind of a little bit of everything, you know, it's, uh, you know, we're not sitting in a sock or anything. Um, but, you know, that's kind of the beauty of the National Guard, right, is, is it can and it has happened where they've been called up to, uh, you know, help out municipalities after a breach uh, to go see if they can, you know, get them back to good, you know, and try and uh, find all the things and put attribution to it. Okay, well, thanks for walking your background. Let's go ahead and get into the rapid fire questions here. So for the new audience members, we're going to do five questions and Trent will have 30 seconds to answer five questions. It's extremely difficult, but we make it hard on purpose. <laughs> if he answers all five questions in 30 seconds, he'll get a bonus six question. that's not related to cybersecurity. Let me pull out my stopwatch here. All right, Trent, are you ready? Oh, good. The, your time will start as soon as I finish asking the first question. Here we go. Do you pronounce it pseudo or pseudo? Pseudo. Most challenging part of your job? Reporting. What was your first computer? Uh, Windows 98 Gateway. Have you ever ran into an ethical dilemma while working in offense security role? Yes or no? Yes. Do you think passwordless authentication is the future? Yes. Boom. Nice. That's uh, 29 seconds. So perfect. You are, uh, I can't remember how many episodes I have recorded at this point, but I think like, I don't know, 12, 13, 14, and you're the fourth one to do it. So congratulations. It's not, that's not an easy feat. So let's go ahead and do the bonus question. You can provide as much or as little explanation as you want to this question. It is not a, it's not a serious question at all. It's uh, just for fun. So here we go. Is a hot dog a sandwich? No. <laughs> no. No. Yeah, you know, I, I think if you if you slice the bread into two into two halves, I think then it's a sandwich. Yeah, you know, I was thinking about this <laughs> week when I when I put this in my notes, and I, that's exactly what I thought too. But then I was like, well, a hot dog bun is almost the same thing as like a sub bun, and a sub is a sandwich. So yeah, you know what I mean. It's 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 a tricky question. My initial thought was no, but then I was hmm. like, it could be, but I think I'm going to stick with no myself. Yeah, I'm going to hunt until I see the evidence. Yeah, until you go to a restaurant and you see hot dogs underneath the sandwiches section. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, I think uh, the most interesting response that you gave was the ethical dilemma. So can you talk about the ethical dilemma or can we not talk about that? Yeah, I think so. Um, there was a client. It was a bank. Uh, we they they for years had had uh, forced red team events on us uh, around the kind of company, and you know always as soon as they do it, they turn the alerts to eleven, and everyone's scouring logs. And oh look, we found you. You know, I, I went through when I was tasked to do that client, and it said pen test in the red team. So it's we're doing a pen test. And, uh, you know, wouldn't, I may have spent some extra time finding a couple extra ways to get to DA, um, uh, but totally dominated the network found, I mean, pages of findings. Um, and then we were in meetings for months after that, you know, arguing with their, uh, with their C-suite, you know, cause they wanted to downgrade every finding, you know, with the, uh, aspect of oh well we call you it's like what well, it wasn't being quiet i trying to find all the things you know um 
And eventually, you know, it wasn't my name on the report and the, the senior, the, the partner of the group, he was the one who put his name on it and ultimately took responsibility for uh, downgrading him, you know, in order to keep a client. You know, I get it from a business aspect, but you're not helping them. Yeah. Yeah. We, that's definitely an ethical dilemma for sure. Like I have heard stories of, you know, clients wanting to downgrade findings or they'll argue with the finding yeah. and, you know, you either got to stick with your guns or you got to, you know, maybe lower and, and keep the, keep the business. Cause if ultimately, you know, if you don't, if the client's not happy, then the repeat business you know, client right. is going to happen, you know? So it's definitely an ethical dilemma for sure. And, uh, you know, if you downgrade the findings and you, so it's like, you know, like you said, you're not helping them as much and that's not good. You know, obviously yeah. that's, we're here to fix problems and security. So I can definitely see, see that. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't, I didn't change it. I let the manager do that. Cause that wasn't, I wasn't going to have that in the commit history. I remember my name. <laughs> yeah. So I guess the, I guess was the root of the problem. Like they thought it was a red team engagement, but you guys thought it was a pen test or something. They didn't well, know the like engagement the letter. Red. Yeah, I did read that it was a pen test. Um, so eventually we did get to, you know, tell them cause usually in the past, you know, they would, as soon as they would see something, they would just, okay, you're off the network, you know, and then it's kind of a waste cause no one's getting any benefit from it. And it, you know, we're not there to steal the credit cards. We're there to find your problems and, and I think that bank prided itself a little bit on the fact that they always did, uh, I mean, they used us for like a couple of years and then always caught us, you know, and it's like, well, we have a week. Attackers have months and years to sit on this, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, That's what makes, uh, yeah, especially if you're on a pen test, like you're not supposed to be sneaky at all. Like, you know, I'm a pen tester. No. I do. Um, my company's just now spinning up red teaming and, uh, hopefully I can do some red teaming in the future. That's my goal anyways, but I haven't been on a single red team engagement. I don't have that skill set yet. Cause I'm still pretty early in my pen testing yeah. career. And, uh, yeah, when I do it, when you do a pen test, like I'm not trying to be stealthy yeah. at all. Like I'm just trying to find as many things as I can and I'm throwing everything I can at this thing because my goal is to just see where your vulnerabilities are. I'm not yeah. trying to be. Uh, you know, emulate a threat actor here. Right. Yeah. Let him get to his money's worth. Find as much as you can. You know? Yeah. And then, you know, a lot of, I've heard stories um, from, so I read the Tribe of Hackers Red Team. Have you read that book? No. No, I have. It's a pretty good book. Um, but a lot, like a common theme that I saw in there, or one of the questions actually that's asked to everybody in that, in that book, um, because basically in that book, uh, the author uh, asks, a bunch of pen testers and red teamers, the same set of questions, but everyone gives you a different answer because mm -hmm. they're all different people. Right. And, uh, one of the questions is like, have you ever turned, turned down a client or a customer for a red team? And one of the common things is like, yeah, I've have turned down a customer for a red team engagement because they just weren't simply ready for a red team engagement. They needed a, a regular pen test. And in some cases they needed a downgrade to like a traditional vulnerability assessment. So yeah, a lot of, yeah, a lot of a lot of companies out there, you know, they want to be secure, but they don't know the differences between us. So it's part right. of our job to like educate them on that, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thanks for sharing that story, because uh, yeah, that's definitely a, that's definitely a thing that you run into. I've definitely heard stories, and I got a couple people on my team that's told me some stuff like that about you know clients arguing findings. And I'm actually, um, actually, I got a, a wrap up call tomorrow, and I am prepared to. Um, you know, for them to argue some of my findings. So yeah. I was given a warning, like, hey, just so you know, they might argue the findings. So we did a pen test for them last year. I was like, oh, all right, well, you know, let me get, let me get ready for defend my findings here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You'll get a, uh, you get plenty of those in consulting, usually at least one a quarter. <laughs> all right. So getting into pen testing. So you said the G pen helped you break into pen testing, mm -hmm. but I would like to know, like did certs like the OSCP, OSEP and the G pen, did it prepare you for real world pen testing and ethical hacking on the job? Yeah. So I originally tried the OSCP, uh, back in 2019 when I was on the old test, extremely green to pen testing. And I, like, I got into a bad spot where I couldn't really study very much. I was, um, you know, between work and travel, and I was gone 12 hours a day during my 90 days. Like, I remember the, the month prior to it, you know, one of the uh, chiefs on the team said, oh, you should go do that, you know, you, you'd, you'd enjoy it. 
I didn't even know what enumerate meant. And he was telling me to take the OSC fee, and boy, did I get destroyed. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so the G pen was great. It was structured. It was it was done very well. Um, I, I took advantage of it because of the uh, Army's credentialing assistance money at the time, so I got it paid for through that. The OSCP, uh, I, especially now that they've added the Active Directory stuff into it, uh, if you can get a workplace to pay for it, it's a fantastic cert. Uh, this last time I took it, because of I had a bit more experience and you know a bit more on the job training, I guess. I had two exam attempts and went and just took one on a Friday night at 11 o'clock at night, so I was like, oh, I got two exam attempts, let's just see how we do I, you know i didn't study or and then you know it's within a couple of hours i had you know active directory pound and two boxes pound and i think i you know well one or two left and it was like oh crap <laughs> i didn't even get your material <laughs> um, nice wow you know and i'm, I'm kind of glad that the buffer overflow is still there but it's not necessarily part of it it's good to know it's good to understand how it works but um you know i haven't written any buffer overflow since you know um, maybe not besides like a CTF or something, you know, but yes, CTFs are great. Uh, I, I, I love doing search. I think they're fun, like especially the structured ones. It's always the OSCP, especially that was a, uh, open experience. That one was, that one was a lot of C-sharp shell code in that one and a lot of getting back to the VBS days. So OSCP is a great one to start. It gives you kind of a, uh, gives you the kind of the breadth of everything, a little bit of web apps, a little bit of network, you know, you know, kind of dabble and see what you enjoy doing. You know, SANS I know is out of reach for a lot of people because it's, I would never pay for it. I only work does, you know, CRTO is on my list. I want to knock that one out eventually. That's a good one. That's, you know, relatively inexpensive. Uh, I know I haven't taken it, uh, but I know people say the PMPT, I know it doesn't hold the same value as like OSCP, but they said the training wise, it's uh, pretty good for, beginners yeah i've heard that as well i, I know a few people that's gotten it. some people that's been on the podcast have had that certain mm-hmm. i haven't heard anybody say anything negative about it what are some skills that you've learned like while on the job or just maybe you know on the internet that wasn't in like a traditional certification or mainstream training like do you have any skills that you're just using day to day that you just didn't learn from traditional training time management for sure yeah uh, you know, if, uh, if you spend all day, all five days, you know, pen testing and that report is due Monday, guess what you're doing over the weekend, you know, um, good note taking, you know, it, it took a while to kind of dig down in what note format I liked and how I like taking notes with findings and such, and, you know, figuring out, um, you know, common commands, different, different, you know, uh, switches and scripts that I wrote. You know, figuring out a way to document those so I can reuse them, um, document all the little commands that you use. I still go back to some of my older notes because it's just like, oh, how do I do this? How do I have the, you know, written down in my kit book, you know, I'll just go and steal real fast. I think learning how to speak authoritatively obviously isn't really taught in any of those courses, but is uh, in a consultant role, especially, you'll kind of you have to figure out how to. You know, talk to clients and how to, how to and it, it, having that help desk experience really kind of helps, I think, because you mm-hmm. you break down a little bit of advanced concepts into something that you know the security engineer might they'll probably understand, but the you know the, the some of the other C suite members definitely aren't going to understand. You know, so yeah, a lot of the soft skills that you know everyone talks about, you, you know, a lot of those you just learn on the job, or, you know, get with experience, but. You know, figure out what note taking thing you want to use and, you know, stick with it. And if it doesn't work, try something else. Yeah, that's interesting you bring up time management because, like, the OSCP, that's that's my highest certification I have right now. And that that is, you know, six machines and you get 24 yeah. hours to, to pwn six machines. And then I, you know, I do my first network test. And there's like 160 IP addresses. And I'm like, whoa, <laughs> yeah. I was not ready for this, dude. I, I thought we were just yeah. doing like a handful of boxes here. So yeah, that's that's a critical skill. And that you're right, that doesn't time management is not taught in those. I mean, you, there no. is time management because you know you only get 24 hours to put right. six boxes, and you are pressed for time. Because um, you know, my when I did OSCP, it took me I was it took me 17 hours, and two of those hours I was probably you know eating and taking breaks. So overall, yeah, I spent yeah. 15 hours on on the computer 
And uh, yeah, you definitely have to manage your time during the exam, but it's a different kind of time management in the real world. You know, yeah. like you said, you got a week to do, you know, 200 IP addresses or something. Yeah. You definitely have to learn to prioritize, uh, you know, where, where you're going to attack, right. You know, you're, you can't end map tack v tack, you know, as CSV, the entire network, you know, you'll do that end map is never going to finish. Yeah. It will. Yeah. After a whole week, like you do that on the whole network it's, it's even a whole week you know five days straight it's still rolling you're like oh my mm-hmm. gosh like i can't believe why did i think this would work <laughs> yeah yeah it's, you definitely it's funny. definitely learn to prioritize and that's not it's kind of talking the classes i guess a little bit you know let's teach you you know hit the low hanging fruit right but like you know there's a big difference between a couple of machines and an enterprise network so uh, which you know i get it's going to be hard to replicate that in a lab it's going to be pretty right. costly but, yeah. you know, that was something I'd learned on the job for sure. It's, you know, how to scan large networks. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, but that was one of the things that was, that was a very rude awakening for me. You know, like how to scan large networks. It's a, it's a different skill set for like than a CTF for a mm-hmm. certification exam for sure. So thanks for bringing that up. So uh, it's not your current role, but it was your last role in the, mm-hmm. uh, Army National Guard, so cyber warfare technician. So, from my understanding, like a cyber warfare technician, it's basically like a United States ABT, but from like the adversary point of view. Is that accurate to say? Like, can I? So it's still kind of the same team, right? It was just I, I they were moving things around. I eventually just moved us to the crew lead position, so because we, we could move and then host the network analysts um, underneath me. Um, otherwise, it was you know no one in charge technically. Um, so it's kind of the same position, but now I just have that little bit of leadership aspect to it. But yeah, the the titles don't necessarily start, uh, I would say, accurate, right? Because oh, okay. they 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 just keep, it's just kind of what's listed on the uh, on the slot. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, it's just you know same thing, same thing as always. You know, digging in, using uh, blue team tools, learning that, learning the DFIR aspect. So, were you doing any kind of um, like hacking or, or red teaming stuff when you was cyber warfare at all? Yeah, so it's kind of the same, kind of like uh, the same position, really, um, just without the leadership aspect. But uh, to an extent, during exercises, you know, we would a lot of times me and the art guy would get pulled uh, to go red team stuff. You know, we just got we were on the uh, red team for um, an exercise up in New England. So we got to participate in that, and uh, you know there was, I don't know, twenty something of us, uh, led by Mar4 Cyber. Um, you know we built the playbooks for three different APTs. Uh, there's six different blue teams, and then you know we'd fire effects, you know, according to the playbooks uh, against them. It was a good time. We got to, you know, they had a the real dam in the uh, in the loop in the virtual environment. Um, so we actually got to like open that up and, you know, let the dirty water go into the clean water in a, uh, you know, mock village, essentially. So you're, you're kind of flip-flopping between, you know, your civilian career and your uh, mm-hmm. National Guard. Uh, you know, like you said you're on orders now. So yeah. is it hard to like flip-flop back and forth like that a lot? Or is it kind of like a nice break from like your civilian career? Is like, is it help with the burnout at all? Like explain like, you know, it's changing gears between you know, going on and off orders, like, how does that work? Yeah. So, it, so thankfully the, to the uh, company I work for now, they're fantastic. They, uh, I, I, you know, when I was interviewing, you know, I, I interviewed a couple of other companies and every time I told them I was going on orders, it's just, okay, call us when you get back. Yeah. Okay. You know, I get it. I understand. Um, and then these guys are like, had no problem with it. They wanted to get me on before I went on orders, even though it was like a week. You know, and, uh, they're fantastic. You know, they, they don't mind the military stuff. It doesn't bother me none. Uh, the cyber team is, is probably one of the best units I've been a part of. They uh, take care of their people really well. You know, they make sure not to uh, intrude on your, you know, civilian life uh, a whole lot. Um, they, yeah, they do a good job. And, yeah, I previously when I was high Mars, it was, uh, or infantry, both of those, it uh, definitely kind of sucked because, you know, then you're you're going to do that after you know that's kind of your time to rest and recoup, and you uh, you're on the field not getting a lot of sleep, and then you got to go back to work on Monday, and it's like oh god. <laughs> so I'm kind of glad I'm not doing that no more. Nice. 
that's good that your company uh is you know works with your your military uh career as well because that was you know i got active duty and you know going in the reserves or the air national guard uh was an option for me and one of the reasons why i didn't um was because I was afraid that some companies would hold it against me, you know, mm-hmm. because you got to miss time from work. Right. And uh, they're not supposed to. They're not legally, you know, allowed right. to hold that against you. But, but I mean, let's be honest. I feel like some <laughs> companies do and can, yeah. you know, get away with it if they want really wanted to. Yeah. So that was one of the reasons why I didn't I didn't do that because, uh, you know, I just I just didn't want to take a bunch of breaks in my civilian career because I, I knew it would be mm-hmm. rough. And, uh, you know, I applaud you for doing what you're doing because uh, I feel like, you know, changing gears like that all the time. You know, when you're active duty, because I was active duty, you know, like you just kind of used to changing gears, but you're still active duty all the time. But, you know, putting the uniform right. off and or putting the uniform on, taking it off all, constantly. That's that, you know, I never experienced that. So it's interesting to learn a little bit about that. Yeah, it's not bad, man. The, uh, so, so what I, I noticed, like the the lower to mid tier companies were harder to get in with the National Guard stuff. Um, you know, help desk and some of the other, you know, mid tier ones. And, um, those were they, I, I think those ones were more applicable to to you know i hate to discriminate but you know so to kind of hold that a little bit uh because you're just kind of a peon you know that's they they don't they just want you to get your time in and you know do what do whatever for the company whereas you know once you get to kind of the more higher tier positions they are looking long term you know they don't if you got to take a time off especially to do cyber training um you know, you're only going to come back and benefit the company more. So uh, it's nice. Yeah, it's a good change. It's uh, glad after, you know, 14 years, it's, it's finally working out. Nice. <laughs> Took long enough. That's, yeah, it's a long time to, to do that. So, yeah, definitely thanks for your service and I uh, appreciate and thank that. Thank you as well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I did six years active duty and, you know, I'm done now. I mean, I yeah. could, uh, I think I just said it, but I could go back and do the reserves or go out National Guard, but mm-hmm. I'm kind of enjoying my civilian life right now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I like, you know, doing my day job and doing my content creation. I have a lot of fun with it. Mm-hmm. Um, so one thing I want to know is, I actually asked this uh, a couple podcast episodes ago, but I always like to have additional perspectives because everyone's got different strategies and opinions on, on you know, how to prepare for you know, offset search. So um, I told you off the recording, I was trying to go for OSEP mm-hmm. and I went to that course a few times and I never took the exam because I didn't feel comfortable, but I got the OSCP on my first try. Like I felt like, don't get me wrong, the OSCP was challenging for me, but I mm-hmm. got on my first try. It wasn't like, it wasn't overwhelming to me. Like I wasn't like in too deep. I just basically got hung up on one machine and it extended my time for mm-hmm. a while. But, uh, but going from OSCP to OSEP, that's a natural progression. That's, you know, pen 200 to pen 300. But I found that's like a, like a, for me, yeah. that feels like a giant leap. It was um, a very big uh, jump. <laughs> so yeah. that's interesting that you bring that you say it's also a pretty big jump. So what, what are some strategies that you use to, you know, overcome that hurdle and like bridge that gap? Yeah. So I took extensive notes uh, with, with uh, all the different code that I had. It was all in my Git book. Um, one of the best things you can do was the first time I took the exam and I failed, I didn't do any of the challenges. Um, I just kind of ran out of time and I was like, you know, I had set the exam set date here and then, you know, some, a bunch of crap happened and I didn't get time to do the challenges and it's like, okay, you know, let's just either way, let's go for it. You know, I have another attempt just in case. Um, and then. It, you know, to get extra practice. And after the first attempt, I was went back through and did it with challenges. And ironically, a lot of the, uh, the code that I had written during the exam was actually used in the labs. <laughs> so I would have, you know, helped myself out quite a bit if I would have, uh, you know, used that code basically from the labs in the exam. Not that it was the same, but it was, you know, it's down the same path. Um, so those challenges are definitely helpful. Making sure that you have all of your code written out in, in a good, easy, copy and pasteable format. Um, you know, it, that one, and especially the first time I went through, I, and I'm, I'm trying to think what happened to my VM, run all your tools through a proxy and make sure they work. 
Um, that really messed me up. I was having some really crazy DNS issues with, you know, Bloodhound and uh, similar tools. Like I tried using a new Bloodhound CE and it was just all sorts of broken through the proxy. Uh, and then I was, you know, scurrying during the exam, trying to get the old one on and running into flight Python dependency issues. And, um, you know, just add, you don't want to just make sure it all works through proxy, even, even if it's, you know, you can test that on like HTB or, you know, say in the, uh, proving grounds, if you have the offset, you know, subscription, it doesn't need to actually be, you know, two hops away. You can still pivot it through a proxy, mm. you know, even if you're just proxying it through your own system, you know, just to make sure that your stuff works. Yeah. I, I like doing CTS. That's always fun to me. I do one, two, maybe a year. Um, in some aspects, you know, I got to finish the holiday hack from Sands last year. There was a small CTF during the next shot up in New England. Um, you know, Sands puts out a handful of memory so often that like hopping on and you get the chance. Um, even if you don't get to do all of it, it's, it's a lot of things that you'll never really see in the real life, except for the Sands holiday hack that had actually, it does include quite a, you'll actually see, but it teaches you to kind of dig into details, right? It's, it's not necessarily the, the, oh, I figured out a hack, you know, this crazy satellite communication stuff, like, it's okay. But, you know, being able to dig in and troubleshoot and, you know, get things working is, uh, definitely going to help. So the SANS holiday hack, or I guess all the SANS CTF. So are they, are they competitions? So they do have a couple of competitions ones uh, where they do hold like a ranking. I know like the boot up CTFs do hold rankings. Uh, the holiday hack is, I don't, that they hold some level of uh, competition with like the write-ups that a lot of people do. Um, and you can win stuff from the write-ups and get, you know, a shout out from that. Um, but, you know, I got to Huddy from last year because I finished them all. So, you know, you just go in that winner's nice. group. <laughs> How does how do you um, sign up for that and actually take part in in those CTF? Yeah, um, I don't think you you might have to. Ha I don't think you actually have to have like a Sans course or anything like that for, for theirs. I want to say, you know, if you Google it's just, uh, just Sans Holiday Act, it, I don't think they're opening registration yet for twenty five four. Well, here it is. Mm -hmm. um, but you can still go back through and do previous holiday hacks, um, do last year's and the years prior. Uh, and use their Discord. Their Discord is fantastic with, um, you know, if you just need a nudge and you, you can search in there, hey, he's working on this thing. And I'm sure someone has asked the question and uh, you can find at least a uh, nudge in the right direction. And I used it in a couple of them. And with the SAN CTFs, are they, do they cost money and are they in person or are they like online based? So, so I know that do some person like during the uh, courses and stuff, but um, no, I've always done uh, free virtual. So, yeah, I don't think I've done, I did one CTF in person and it went horribly. I was back when, before I took the OSCP the first time and I had no business messing around in that. I think I just opened up Armitage and just started throwing crap at the wall. <laughs> Yeah, there's like a button that's like auto hack and literally just yeah. tries every meta split module possible. <laughs> I was like, I don't know, man. Just, just hopefully, yeah, no best. business. It's like sending a Hail Mary. I think that's what it's called, yeah. a Hail Mary. Yeah, I think it is. Yeah. 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 I haven't used that I don't since. Use, <laughs> I don't use our Artemage. Uh, so, for the listeners and viewers, the Artemage is basically the GUI version of Metasploit. I always just use the command line of Metasploit. I think it, it just works better for me. So, but yeah, the GUI, uh, yeah, I think there's literally a button just called Hail Mary and you just click and it just okay. fires everything. That's funny. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and I mean, it's like about Metasploit, right? With OSCP, you're only allowed to use it once. Um, when you're going through the training, if you see that something is exploitable by Metasploit, use it. If, if it exploits and it works, then you know that that thing is exploitable by that CVE or that, you know, vulnerability, and then go back through and find, you know, the proof of concept code. And, you know, then you have, you know that you're going down the right track, you know, 
it doesn't say that you can't use it more than once in the labs. Utilize it, you know, just to, to prove that this is the exploitable route that you should be taking, you know, just to uh, help build that confidence a little bit that, you know, to know you're looking at is, is correct. Yeah, um, it, I'm glad you mentioned that because the I think one of the boxes, or at least in the old labs, one of the boxes, um, I was trying to figure out how to exploit it. I found a vulnerability. But I was trying to exploit it, you know, not through Metasploit because I was trying to, yeah. you know, not use Metasploit because you only get to use it one time during right. the exam. And I went to the Discord and was like, "How do you exploit this without Metasploit?" And the, like offset the the mentors are like, "No, we intend you guys to use Metasploit here. Like, we, <laughs> that's the that's the solution." And we're like, "Oh, all right." Yeah. But w- with your with your exam, you know, um, like you get you do get a try. You one machine you can have Metasploit, yeah. and if it fails, then you're still locked in that machine. So if you yeah. hit a box and it fails, and you still have you're still locked in that machine. But if it succeeds, yeah. you can still keep using Metasploit. So you can theoretically you know, privilege escalation with Metasploit too on that same box. So um, I didn't use Metasploit uh, like as did. my exam. And I uh, I did, there was a box that I didn't, I didn't get into and I did fire Metasploit uh, module at, like last minute. I, I had enough points to pass. I was like, oh, let's see if I can just get 10 more points real quick and it failed. I'm just like, I'm going to bed. Like I got enough points. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I remember the, uh, the first year or the first time I tried it, um, I think I, I think I started at like one in the afternoon or something and, uh, and, you know, hammer away all day, finally go to bed at like, you know, five in the morning or something, catch three hours of sleep. And I, there was one of the boxes I was like, I, I, I can't think of any other route. I can't find nothing. I think it's this route, you know, I kept trying all the, you know, get up, proof of concepts. And I'm sure that there was something stupid about it, but, um, I think it was like noon or something. And then, you know, the next day I forgot that I had used Metasploit or then I knew that and had a, a module for it. And I was like, yeah, let's just see if it runs. I haven't ran it. Like, even if I get this box, I'm going to fail. Who cares? You know, and punch it in and then immediately get a shell. And I'm like, oh my God, you know, trying to hammer away, trying to, <laughs> I'm like, there's a chance, you know. <laughs> nice. But All right. Well, Unfortunately, we're out of time, so I'm going to ask you the final question. Do you have any additional cybersecurity hot takes or hidden wisdom you'd like to share? Yeah, um, it's okay to take a break uh, every once in a while so you don't burn out. That's uh, for sure. That's that's just a little bit of wisdom. It's okay to go take a hike or go on a vacation and not study or bring your laptop and relax. Uh, I guess for a hot take. And I, I'm going to, the AI is not taking our jobs. We're in a safe field. <laughs> I made a video about that recently. And I said, you know, in five years, a little over five years, I feel like entry level jobs might, a uh, big might, you know, it could, yeah. I, I don't see it. I don't think it's like super confirmed, but um, yeah, I feel like as long as you're learning and you're keeping your skills up to date, then you're safe. Mm-hmm. You know, that's, that's basically, as long as you keep learning stuff, you're, you'll be all right. Yeah. AI is going to create the uh, vulnerable software for us. So start learning web apps. <laughs> Not, yeah, that's a good point. Wow, they are going to. Yep, that's a good point. Well, Trent, thanks for your time. And uh, where can the audience get a hold of you if they want to connect with you? Yeah, uh, LinkedIn is probably the easiest way. Uh, just I think Trent or Trent and Daryl, I can't remember which. I uh, have on there. Um, I have a Twitter. Don't ever get on it. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I don't know. Twitter locked out in the racks. They, I haven't been able to like, I can't like anything or add any more followers. I don't know. I don't just know that never looked into it. So yeah, LinkedIn is probably the easiest way. And LinkedIn is also the easiest way to contact me audience. If you want to get a hold of me as well as kaiserclerk.com, my website. Thank you, Trent, for taking your time doing this. I really do appreciate it. I, I got a lot of value out of this. I believe the audience got a lot of value out of this. So, um, yeah, thanks for doing this. And, uh, audience, if you haven't reviewed the show already on Spotify and Apple Podcasts, do me a favor, do a five-star review. That'd be that'd be the best way to support the show right now. So if you can do that, I'd appreciate it. Until then, I'll see you on the next episode. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Kaiser, out.